Sunday. I uh, hope you have uh, come today with uh, the heart open to uh, worship. A few announcements before Kevin officially opens us. Uh, just a reminder, we do have an annual meeting today that will be following this service. There will be a video and then, of course, the voting. Uh, there, you have information in your bulletin concerning a women's Bible study. If you're interested in that, ladies, please place that in the uh, offering tray today. On your way in today, either in the North X or in the uh, area by the mailboxes, you saw annual reports. There's also some in the old secretary's office, as we call it. Uh, please take those and read uh, about the year past uh, from different parts of the congregation. Obviously, uh, even with the person speaking today, you might need reading material, so if you get up during uh, the service today, it'll be understandable. Without further ado, Kevin. Welcome, everybody. Welcome for, uh, to worship uh, here at Banks Reformed Church. Glad you're all here. All our members, all of our guests, and all the people listening and watching online, we really appreciate you being here with us. I uh, hope you're uh, here to worship this morning. What a great song we opened up with, The Father's House. It ties right in with what Kevin's been preaching on the last couple of Sundays, The Prodigal Son and Being at the Father's House. So let's all stand together now and let's sing Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. <clears throat>
Before we go into prayer, and guys, if the uh, Apostle Creed's up there, we'll load that after I finish here. Before we go into prayer, let me just announce Shirley Frank is uh, back in surgery. Uh, she's at Forsyth. So please, uh, that was Friday, right, Joey? She went back in on Friday uh, for some follow-up surgery that was not really scheduled. Uh, if you're not aware, she's had a leg amputated. So they've had to uh, do some more surgery on that. So please keep Shirley in your thoughts and prayers. Also, in this world that we are currently living in, uh, there's always uh, something going on in there. Uh, doesn't matter what it is. And I think the, uh, the lesson we need to learn from this is very simply. We look at ourselves too often for answers. We think our politic politics and our parties and our governments and all this stuff can, uh, can solve our problems. Uh, but... You know, there should the history of the world sort of tells us that's not possible. Uh, that we look for solutions, and the solutions that we come up with are often worse than the problems that we have. So, uh, as you go to this time of prayer quietly on your own, you lift up names and thoughts that you have before we join together in corporate prayer. So, let's bow our heads.
Father God, we come to you this morning thankful for the beauty of this day and the world in which you have indeed created. And we come to you admitting that uh, we indeed are, are one of the great trans transgressors against that which you have done. Forgive us. In each of our hearts enlisted as a, a church body, there are names that we are presenting towards you. May your will be done. And as that is being done, Father, direct doctors, family members, and those who are in need of your care, direct their hearts to find strength for you. And as a church, may we be seeking your way and your will. For indeed, we are to be your instrument to bring those that are lost to finding your life, your resurrection, in your grace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Before we go on, we'll just move on. If you have lost some keys, we've been talking about lost here a lot lately, haven't we? If you've lost some keys, they have been found. Uh, so they'll be laying right up here. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Luke chapter 15, uh, selected verses followed by Luke chapter 6, 20th through the 26th verses. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in while living. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. So he got up and went to his father. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. And from Luke 6, 20th through 26th. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. God bless the reading of his holy word. Let us continue with the giving of our tithes and offerings.
Lord. Our kind and our gracious Heavenly Father, you bless us each and every day of our lives. You bless us according to your will and you equip us to do your work here on earth. I pray that you would bless these our offerings, that you would multiply them, and that you would use them to extend your kingdom here on earth. Bless us each day. Guide us to do your work. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
We indeed are fortunate to have uh, those who have been given talents by God, and then they're willing to share them. And that indeed uh, is special. And we thank all of you uh, for giving of your time, but more importantly, taking a gift that was given to you and, and sharing it, and we appreciate it. Uh, one thing before I begin. Donald and Joanne Hedrick, congratulations, 63 years of marriage, and their knees aren't worn out yet. That's pretty good. <laughs> Real short disclaimer, CIA class, uh, there's a little bit of last Sunday school's lesson that snuck into this sermon, so when we get to that, please don't tune me out because after that, I bring in some new stuff and you might need to, so don't, don't jump out on me. As we've been studying the prodigal son, throughout the gospel, Christ routinely speaks of sin and salvation in the terms of being lost and found. And we've seen that in the short parables of Luke 15 with the lost sheep and the lost coin, and of course, with the prodigal son, our focus. Two brothers lost, pursuing the goals of wealth and power while utilizing different methods and tactics. Looking at this chapter in Luke, it's easy to see that Christ's ministry can be viewed as a rescue mission to find and save those that are lost by opening their hearts and minds to the need of a great reversal of their lives that they are centered upon God. Most everyone in here would agree that the life of the younger son was dangerous and damaging. However, as we explored last week, Christ expanded the idea of being spiritually lost to include the legal and moral righteous. In this parable, Christ presents his concern for the moral conformist, those people who see that they are better because they lead a right and just life, like the elder son and the Pharisees, who believe their religious correctness provided them an advantage over other people and possibly even over God. Christ warned that people with this view may be unaware of how drastically and dangerously lost they are. The younger son's lostness brings him to a pigsty where he eventually comes to his senses. The older brother is lost in a different but equally devastating way, and his lostness also brings strife and struggle to his family. Yet, he stands defiantly, confidently, and condescendingly outside the celebration, refusing his father's request to celebrate his brother's return. To help with this idea of a great reversal, I'm going to relate the following short story from the Christian writer Elizabeth Elliot. <clears throat> One day, Christ said to his disciples, I'd like you to carry a stone for me. He did not give them any explanation. So the disciples looked around for a stone, and the practical Peter picked up a pretty pocket stone. Because, after all, Christ not, uh, did not give a size or weight requirement. So why bother with a large rock? After the disciples had gathered their stones, Christ said, follow me, and they began their journey. Around lunchtime, everyone sat down, and Christ waved his hands, and the stones turned into bread. In just a few seconds, Peter's lunch was over. When everyone had finished, Christ told them to stand and then said, I'd like you to carry a stone for me. Peter now says, aha, I get it. And he picks up a small boulder, lifts it to his back, and struggles along in his journey. To keep himself motivated, motivated he keeps saying to himself, I can't wait until supper. <laughs> they continue on their journey, and then around supper time, they stop beside a river. Christ looks at all his disciples and says to them, now, everyone, throw your stones into the water. And they did. All the disciples were puzzled. So Christ, Christ looked at them and said, 
Don't you remember what I asked you to do? Who were you, who were you carrying the stone for? Yourself and for your personal gain or for me? Peter expected a payday for his efforts in obeying Christ. If you think about, if you think goodness has as its purpose personal gain, as Peter thought a larger stone would give him a better meal, then anger and disappointment become familiar emotions in your life. After all, if I don't get rewarded for my good work, why give up my time and treasure? That's the world. The need for this great reversal was also presented, as we heard from the scripture reading today, by Luke in his account of the Sermon on the Mount. To our contemporary ears, the word kingdom is associated with a governmental power or a reign of authority. This type of kingdom arranges society and governs its people. However, Christ consistently speaks of God's kingdom and are entering into this new kingdom when we repent and form a faith relationship. In the passage heard today from Luke 6, Christ lays out this great reversal in God's kingdom. In our world, the words rich, full, laugh, and being spoken well of are worthy goals. Yet, Christ sees these worldly motivators as not hitting the target in our lives. He states that if these are our goals, then we should beware because you have already received your comfort. To the world, this does not make sense and it even is counterintuitive. This idea of a great spiritual reversal continues as Christ tells his disciples that those who are full in this life will be hungry and laughed at because they gloated about their worldly success. He warns that one day they will mourn and weep over their spiritual errors. This call for self-examination of the motivators in our lives is indeed a reversal of our normal worldly thoughts and ambitions. Christ introduced this great reversal when he stated that those that are poor, hungry, weep, and are disliked for his name will be rewarded and eventually find joy. Now, do not take this to mean that we're all to live on top of a mountaintop as a hermit monk. The, book, the wisdom book of Proverbs focuses much on the attention of living a godly, and quality life while Christ speaks routinely of being a good citizen and contributors in our communities. What Christ is asking us to ponder is this, how do we deal with life's hardships? Because they are inevitable. Things simply will not go our way all the time. And when tough days occur, will we strive to take these experiences and turn them into spiritual wisdom? Or do we become bitter and vindictive because our, we were not rewarded for all of our good deeds? The younger son pursued a world of self, wasted his blessings, but eventually repents. He learns the lessons of hunger, poor, weeping, and being forgotten. But he does not allow them to wash away into bitterness or surrender. He comes to his senses. In other words, he comes to God. And in accepting his sin, he is welcomed by his father and receives much needed grace. The elder son sees Worldly blessings is something that he has earned and deserves because I'm a good guy. He resents his brother, even refusing to acknowledge him as such, as he says to his father in verse 20, this son of yours. 
This elder son sees life as gain or loss as measured through the eyes of the world. He is the individual who would say to someone down on his luck to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, even if they never had a pair of boots on their feet. The elder son elevates his life by how his moral righteousness compares to others, not by his love for God and his fellow men. His view of the world prevented him from seeing the need for a spiritual reversal in his life. Now, the elder son's view should not be shocking to us. As it is in our daily lives, embedded in our economy, and as part of training in business classes all over this country. Now, please don't go start picketing colleges and trying to burn down their MBA programs. <coughs> because they're teaching something that most of us in this room agree with. And might even practice to some degree. The first lesson is simple. If you cheat, you will eventually get caught, and that will be bad for business. Simple and agreeable, so don't cheat. The second is that if you have an honest business, employee morale will be good as the workers feel better about themselves and their work. Customers will be more satisfied. And all that is good for the bottom line. Embedded in this motivation is the idea that workers can look down on their competitors and gloat about their moral superiority and their better business performance. These ideas all have a very common thread. They appeal to our fear as the business might lose its license if caught cheating while low staff morale results in a reduced profit margin. Being honest is done for personal gain and financial profit, not because it is a positive and godly way to treat others. This business school approach leads to a begrudgingly compliance to the law and a desire to lay, locate those really good accountants and lawyers when seeking ways to get around some disliked <coughs> business regulation. It's one thing to be honest for personal gain. It's another for God's sake, for truth's sake, and for the betterment of others. A person motivated by love for God and others will obey the law with transparency and with integrity, a total reversal from the purpose of an obligated, moralistic, and complaining business conformist. Christ is informing us that honesty based upon fear does nothing to fight the root of evil in ourselves and in the world, as it does not, it cannot address our self-centered hearts. Elder brothers might help other people but if their motivation is fear and the moralistic view that God will bless them for their goodness, they are actually practicing a secular Pharisee view of faith and religion. Their motivation for helping others is done to better feed and clothe themselves and increase profit with the side benefit of being perceived as good by other people. Such acts of kindness are self-centered tools that are nurtured by fear, a lack of faith, and a desire for personal well-being as being good is driven by their pocketbook, not by their heart, and love for God and others. The Pharisees do not understand, nor can they accept that sinners are attracted to Christ. I'm pausing there. Let that sink in for a minute. Sinners were attracted to Christ. Their traditions and regulations blinded them to Christ's works and his actions. As they probably said something like this. Just look at those people. They make me uncomfortable. 
just being around them. They are not worthy of my time nor my effort. They can do better, and they just need to start. Notice that God is absent in this thought. It is all about one's own personal comfort level. Unfortunately, today's church needs to examine and better understand the view of the Pharisees if we desire to be the church that Christ charges us to be. It is indeed likely that the attitude of the elder, elder brother contributed to his younger brother's desire to leave home. Or simply put, take the money and run. The many denominational struggles and media grabbing church leadership issues and scandals give people both in and out of the church the idea that the church is too often the elder brother and not the loving father. In a world full of uncertainty and doubt, when people turn to the church for answers and instead of seeing Christ, they see commonly found worldly issues and concerns, we fail in our mission. When the church cannot agree on its principles and purpose, it creates the thought for many to why bother while providing a convenient and comfortable excuse to make Sunday a personal or family fun day. While there are many layers of this of life application to this parable, and we're going to continue exploring them, the fact cannot be ignored that Christ directed much of its meaning toward the Pharisees and their need for spiritual evaluation. The younger son even while immersed in his sin, knew that he was alienated from God. We know this because he came to his senses, implying he knew the truth at one time, but instead selfishly sought the world. He knew that he needed to repent and return to God. Then he could be forgiven and welcomed home. However, the elder son, standing outside the celebration, cannot see his need for self-examination. He thinks his father is wrong by welcoming home a sinner. And he cannot bring himself to join in this so-called celebration. Just look. As his brother received a fattened calf, and he never received even a goat, to share with his friends. Can't you hear the word unfair coming from his lips? This is why Christ tells us that self-righteousness, lostness, is so dangerous. If the world sees Christianity as a set of rules, regulations, requirements, and doctrine, then we will fail reaching the lost that are around us. Why Christ correctly calls us away for the destructive, from the destructive life of the younger brother, he also condemns the moralistic, pious, and condescending ways of the Pharisees. Our faith should not be centered on fear, self-righteousness, personal gain, and finger pointing. These are the signs of a faith Insecurity that makes the church oversensitive to criticism and too quick to condemn others, which makes the church unwelcoming to younger brothers in need of the great reversal of Christ in their lives. Finally, let me address a question that I am certain is present in your minds right now and must be answered before we can continue next week. Isn't Christ exaggerating? Most people who resemble the younger brother do not end up in a pigsty. And religious people who think God will reward them because of their moralistic stance are not heartless and angry. Now, really, isn't this just a bit too much? 
I believe the answer to that question is very simple. It's an emphatic no. Both approaches that Christ presents to these brothers has embedded in them the seeds of destruction for self, for family, and for others. This parable should create concern for every thoughtful Christian. Christ has clearly presented that we will never stop being the younger or older brother until we acknowledge our need to place our faith, our hearts, our love, and our focus into the wonders, the works, and the resurrection of Christ. When we as individuals or as a corporate body known as the church champion ourselves as opposing this or that instead of being centered on bringing Christ to the lost, we are easily perceived as finger-pointing Pharisees. It seems reasonable to believe that if the elder son knew that his heart and his self-centeredness were causes of grief for his father and his brother, he would have been able to forgive his brother and join this family in celebration. Instead, he remains outside in righteous condemnation. Since he did not see himself in need of forgiveness, his anger toward his father and brother eventually becomes his own personal prison as he defiantly and confidently points his fingers at those celebrating inside. Luke makes sure that we see this when he introduces this chapter by informing us that the Pharisees were upset because Christ attracted tax collectors and sinners. Christ is preventing, presenting a very powerful and alarming and warning message and a challenge to Christians everywhere. If we believe we, believe we are to be his instruments of faith, of hope, of peace, and of joy to lost brothers, then there needs to be a great reversal in our hearts and the hearts in which we come in contact, contact with daily. Christ is indeed the great reversal so needed in our lives and in this world. Amen. Let's all stand and sing together hymn number 92, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling.
Let's bow our heads, please. Father, the uh, words that you have given to those who have put together what we call the Bible is full of so many challenges, so many things that on the surface may present one story, but then as we explore and dig, we find more. Indeed, it is inspired by you. We thank you for it. But mostly, Father, we thank you that you gave us the son to this world that is in sole need of a great reversal. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen.